Welcome back to the expert walkthrough for Dark Souls 2, ladies and gentlemen. We left off here in Majula, and uh, it is time to resume our journey through Drenglik. So, we talked to her last time, we got the option to level up, and we can now increase the power of our Estus Flask. The start of this episode is going to be a little bit slower, not so action-packed, because I'm going to be showing you the different NPCs. We're going to be looting the various items that are scattered throughout Majula, and it's not going to take that long, but it'll take probably about half the episode, or a decent chunk, rather. Over here, you've got a soul item and three life gems. Definitely useful stuff that we want. Lenegrast is the blacksmith. He is the first NPC that you should talk to because he gives you a goal. Who are you? Oh, it doesn't matter. Just help me open this door. I packed my tools in here, seeing it was vacant. But now somebody's gone and locked the door. All right, he seems very demanding and rude, but I promise you he's not that much of a jerk. He's actually a very vital NPC that you want, and you definitely would benefit from helping him because he's going to open up a window of convenience for you. I'm a blacksmith. I'm nothing without my tools. Bring me that key. Chop, chop. And that is all that he has to say to you. So, you're going to notice one key thing. <laughs> See what I did there? You're going to notice one key thing that he left out. His name. So, we're not really going to know what key to go grab because we don't have a name or anything. Well, it's going to be one of the first keys that you encounter in the game. Trust me, you're going to know exactly which one it is and you're going to know exactly what to do with it. So, there's no worry there. Now, there is an NPC up top there on the monument. We are going to go talk to him last, though, because his dialogue is by far the longest. Most of you who have played this game already know what I'm talking about. It's rather painful to sit through his dialogue, but he tells us some useful things. Okay, we got a life gem over here. Now, this is the entrance to Hades Tower of Flame. We're not going to be going there for a little bit, but... If you head up this direction, you get access to a covenant, and there is an item up here. Five Homeward Bones. They return you to the bonfire when you use them. It's a very useful item. This right here is the Victor's Stone. It is how you join the Champion's Covenant, and the Covenant of Champions offers one incredible thing to you. The Vanquisher's Seal, which greatly increases the damage of your fists with no weapons being used. It is a very overpowered item. I have tested it myself in PvP. It destroys. But I'm not going to be getting that in this playthrough, so I don't want to join this covenant. However, if you uh, just bring up the option thing to join it, you get the trophy, I believe. You have to offer an all stone to it, which is an item that only drops when you're in the covenant. But the purpose of this covenant is very difficult, because what it does is it raises the difficulty of the game to an extraordinary level, like even worse than New Game Plus, basically, with no benefits. You don't get any of the benefits of New Game Plus. You only get the difficulty of the enemies. So we're definitely not going to be bothering with that. And when you run over here, there are two houses you can go into. There are three. There's one house right here, there's a mansion in the center, and then there's one over there. Cannot go inside the mansion yet, because we do need a key for that. However, we will run into the NPC that drops that key for us when we get to the Forest of Fallen Giants. In this first house, you are going to meet one of my favorite NPCs in the game. If I can find her. There she is. Oh, undead, are we? And one without much time remaining. Just about ready to fall apart, I'd say. Not exactly the time to be chatting with a cat. <laughs> well, suit yourself. Oh yes, you may call me Shalqua. Enchante. So, what did you want anyway? Ooh, you smell wonderful. <laughs> This is Xiao Kua. She is one of my favorite NPCs. I love how her actions completely contradict her attitude. I mean, she appears to be nothing more than just an ordinary house cat. 
but she's actually a very interesting NPC. She knows more about everything that's going on in this game than any other NPC. She seems to have a lot of background information. She seems very well informed of the situation of the world right now, and even the world before. She's very old. You can tell when you talk to her that she is ancient. She has been and she has been through a lot, she's experienced many things, and she has seen more than most NPCs in this game. So, she is a merchant. You can buy special rings from her, only uh, two of which I'm going to get in this playthrough. She sells the Ring of the Evil Eye, which gives you a set amount of HP after every enemy you kill. It's, it's microscopic, it's not that great. The Silver Cat Ring is the most important ring that she sells, to us anyway. It reduces fall damage greatly, so most falls that would kill us would uh, probably leave us with about 10% of our HP, which is, you know, it. the ends justifies the means because we're not going to die even though we took a risky jump, right? So, the Ring of Whispers is the second important ring that she sells. It's uh, a ring that allows you to hear the voices of enemies. It is only useful for one particular NPC in the game, but it's a good NPC who gives you an awesome item. The Name Engraved Ring is uh, an online play item. It gives you a selection of gods to choose from. I believe it's a list of ten or something like that. When you and a player choose a set god, you guys will be able to see each other's signs easier. It uh, increases the room for connection, as in the soul memory system. I'll explain that in a later video, probably. And uh, it's just a ring that helps you connect easier when you're trying to play with particular people. The Red Eye Ring is uh, a ring that causes enemies to be drawn to you versus NPC phantoms or other players that you're with. And uh, it has a really cool effect. It causes your eyes to glow red and it leaves sort of like a streak when you run around. It's really cool. She also sells Homeward Bones, Prism Stones, Alluring Skulls, and the Lloyd's Talisman. These are all useful items to an extent, but I do not need them from her. The other unique thing that Shaqua can do is she can terminate you from your covenant if you don't want to be in your covenant anymore, and she can also check up on all of your covenant statuses, meaning as you join different covenants, uh, covenants over your playthrough, she will give you the ability to see your progress with those. You can see your rank, you can see all of that nonsense. It's really cool. I'm not going to be exhausting these NPCs' dialogue because it takes forever, and, I mean, it's not necessarily essential to the game. You can talk to them if you want lore information, but I'm not necessarily concerned with that. I just want to Nothing progress for right now. Do, I presume? Well, that's dismaying. <laughs> okay. We will talk to her a bit later. Now, this right here... If you get into the mansion and you walk up there, you're going to be able to look down to the well and see that there's an item down there pretty easily. But most people aren't going to know about this item in their first however however long of the game, 30 minutes to an hour, until they get to the mansion. That's probably going to be the first time that... Okay. That flag hanging up there kind of freaked me out for a second. It looked sort of like a spider in the corner of my screen. Not that I'm scared of spiders, but I mean, a spider that big? Are you kidding me? All I have is this little hand axe? Yeah, that would have scared the crap out of me. Um, anyway, if you hit this right here, if I can hit it, there we go, it'll bring up the body for a very, very important item that you don't want to miss. An Estus Flask Shard. The Estus Flask Shard increases the uses of your Estus. Meaning, instead of having just one Estus, like we have right now, when we give this to the Emerald Herald, we will have two Estus Flasks. You have a maximum of 12 per playthrough. Well, period. Because when you get a New Game Plus, it does not increase your uh, maximum Estus Flask. So you can only have 12 per playthrough, as in that character. So these pigs over here are undead pigs. They hit like a truck in the beginning of the game if you don't have very much defense, and there's three of them over there. When they gang up on you, they will kill you incredibly fast. They're not really worth fighting, because once you aggro them, they pull for the entirety of Majula. They will chase you forever until you get rest of the bonfire. And they only drop, well, it's a very small percentage anyways, to drop a cracked red eye orb, which isn't really worth it because there's um, steadier sources to get those throughout the game. 
So, yeah, don't mess with the pigs. They don't drop very many souls. They only give you cracked red eye orb. It's not really worth it. Can't get into the mansion, as I explained already. This gaping hole right here is the entrance to uh, three different areas in the game that you can get to by going down there. It will take you to the Grave of Saints, or it will take you to the gutter. And in turn, the gutter leads to the Black Gulch. And we'll be doing all of that much later. Like, definitely not right now, because going down there, you do require the cat ring to get down there right now. However, we will come across an NPC later in the game who will drop a ladder here for us that'll make it a lot easier. I haven't decided if I'm just going to use the cat ring to get down there or if I'm going to use the ladder and just wait that long to go down here. It is uh, not decided yet, but either way, you guys are going to see both options happen over the course of the playthrough. Our next important NPC is Malin, the armor seller. Uh, oh. oh hello there. W welcome to my uh, shop. I'm Morlin, and I, well, I sell armor. Oh, sorry, I... Please do have a look at my wares. I could really use the business, if you'd be so kind. Okay, now, Mullen sells very crucial equipment in the beginning of the game. If you don't have a shield with your starting class, I highly recommend you invest in the, enough strength to use the Silver Eagle Kite Shield and use this shield first. It blocks 90% physical damage, and everything else on it is pretty typical. It has 50 stability, and it only weighs 3 units. This is an excellent shield in the beginning of the game. I highly recommend you get this shield, if you have enough strength for it. Because this shield will make the beginning of the game that much easier for you if you can block 90% of most attacks. Versus just getting hit for full damage. He sells the standard armor, which is the warrior's starting armor. He sells the infantry armor, which is the armor worn by the hollow soldiers, the foot soldiers that you see all over the place. And he also sells the Faulkner armor, which is the starting armor of the knight class. Now, these armors are pretty standard, but I don't need any of them because my bandit armor that I started out with is actually pretty good. Do not underestimate the bandit armor. It's a really good starting armor. Now, I am not going to buy this shield. I would highly recommend that you do this, but I would like to conserve the souls. I can think of better ways to spend 1,500 souls since I don't need a shield right now. If you do what I do, which is wait to get a shield that's just as good in the next level that we're about to do, it'll be worth it to save that uh, 1,500 souls because there are other shields that are on par with this one very early in the playthrough, and if you're patient, you can get them. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a little patient, and I'm going to grab something that's just as good that we're going to get a little bit later. Well, I, I, well, I do hope I see you again. Now, the interesting thing about Maulin is that his attitude changes drastically depending on how much money you spend, or souls, rather. He seems really shy, soft-spoken, and hesitant right now, but if you keep spending souls to buy his stuff, not only will he increase his stock, he will sell better things as you keep buying stuff from him, his attitude changes as well. He turns into a, an egotistical weirdo. You guys will see what I mean. Do not forget to go up this ladder because there's an item up here that you definitely want. A Titanite Shard. The Titanite Shard is the upgrade material for standard equipment. This is the upgrade material that you are going to be using the most for all of your standard equipment. There are different upgrade materials in this game, but the Titanite Shard is the most common because it is used to upgrade the common equipment. So we're definitely going to be getting a lot of that. There are some really good items scattered across Majula as long as you search for them. So that is all of the items, starting off in Majula. And in the last video, I said we were going to go here and do this little optional area. Now, this is the entrance to a completely new area in the game that we cannot access this early. However, there's nothing wrong with going here and becoming familiar with where we're about to go. Because there's actually an interesting NPC over here too.
This is Ben Hart. He is a friendly NPC, and he is also a friendly NPC summon. You can use him against certain bosses in this game. Have you business with me? The way you end up is all blocked up, you see, by this god awful statue. Heavens above. Who thought it a good idea to pit it there? Oof. I'm in quite the pickle now. Okay. There is an item right next to him. Life gems and homeward bones. We definitely want those. This is the statue he was talking about. Statue blocks your way. This, uh, this woman was petrified while trying to pull the handle that is going to open this door, and that's why we can't proceed. There are doors up here, and they are not just for show. There are enemies behind all of them. Relax, though, because the ones up there, you don't have to worry about. Those doors are not going to open. These ones, however, you can open yourselves. There is one enemy in each of these. That item in there is uh, a Lloyd's Talisman, I believe. He's stuck in there. These enemies don't open the doors, but they can break them. So if you get their attention, you need to be careful and take responsibility for what you've done. Notice how we don't do very much damage to this guy. Well, there's a reason, because you're probably not supposed to go over here yet. This enemy is a lot stronger than the ones that you're going to face in uh, the couple starting levels. Seeing as how they're slow, it's good practice for criticals. I don't recommend trying to parry them, because they do poison damage with their weapon. But they go down pretty easy. They drop 90 souls. So that's, uh, that's free souls, if you're brave. And uh, you get a Lloyd's Talisman, which is not very important. Let me go ahead and knock this guy out, too. And get a free hit on him before I run away. Now, this guy doesn't have a weapon, so he's not as much of a threat. But do not underestimate him, because he's still going to be a problem for you. If you don't know what you're doing. Like I said, though, it's good practice for backstabs. So we'll uh, go ahead and get rid of them. Now we're gonna go finish his dialogue. See that statue? Gives me the willies. You stare at it for long enough, it starts to look alive. Ah, it just doesn't seem quite right. There are no craftsmen around these parts. Hey, you don't think a real life person was turned to stone, do you? Well, it's quite the possibility, Ben Hart. Moving on. It's time to get out of this depressing hallway of the forest. Alright, we need to head back to Majula. And... I believe that's just about everything for the starting area. Uh, yeah, we got everything... Everything that I can make a mental note of, anyway. So now, we just need to talk to Salden. And we will be good to go start kicking some more ass. Alright, I have low endurance. I'm almost there, Salden. Just bear with me. I have no stamina. I'm a noob. Okay. Salden here, he doesn't ever leave. He stays here for eternity. He is sitting next to a death count. There are, that's a big number, 125,200,840 deaths on Dark Souls 2 for PC. That does not mean that everybody sucks. That just means that there are a lot of people playing it. And a lot of those deaths are PvP. I can tell you that for a fact. When you go behind Salden here, there is just, uh, the letters are worn beyond recognition. Now. To my experience, there is absolutely no significance to this. It's sort of like the pendant for Dark Souls 2. Miyazaki, even though he wasn't involved in the project, this right here is sort of like a rub-off of what he would have done. It's just a troll. It's meant to make you think that it's important when it really has no purpose whatsoever. I don't know how many people on here watch Epic Name Bro, but he really got us with that. In the beginning of his first playthrough, he looked at it and he was like, Oh, what's that? I'm sure that's nothing. Pulled our legs, made us start thinking, and then he told us that it was useless. So, 
congrats to him and the developers for Dark Souls 2. You got us. You're undead, aren't you? You have that distinct scent, the smell of irreversible fate. This is Majula. It is a kind of settlement. A place where life is almost normal. And in Drang Lake these days, there are very few places like that. Okay, I'm just going to warn you guys real quick before I continue talking to him. You can skip ahead in the video if you want, it's not going to hurt my feelings at all. Saldin's dialogue is very long. It's going to take probably five or six minutes to exhaust it because he has a lot to say. Not that the things that he says are pointless, he does give you very good information, he tells you about the three optional starting areas of the game, he tells you three different directions you can go first, and uh, he also offers you a covenant. And I believe after 50 deaths in your first playthrough, he will offer you the Ring of Steel Protection, if I remember correctly. So we're going to go ahead and get started exhausting his dialogues, it's going to take a while, you can skip ahead if you want, but if you want to hear what he has to say, by all means. I am Solden, and like you, I lost everything, and now I'm here. You probably heard that it was possible to break the curse here. Well, that's not true at all. There's nothing here for you, me, or anybody. Do you know much about souls? Even I'm not certain, but... I'm told that the soul is the essence of life itself. Anything living, sentient or no, supposedly has one. What we call the curse is traceable to the soul. Do you see what that means? To be alive to walk this earth. That's the real curse right there. We undead will never die. And that's quite a predicament, really. There are four beings in this land with giant souls. And wherever you go from here, you'll sooner or later come up against them. Each has a powerful soul, and a terrible curse. If that frightens you, then you ought to just give up right now. Like I have. <laughs> Do you ever cry out for help? The journey of an undead is long and treacherous. You will face invaders from other worlds at every turn. If you need help, why not proclaim faith in the Blue Sentinels? When you face danger, the Blue Sentinels will come to your aid. Protection is yours, if you wish. You need only accept their kind embrace. Okay. I do not want to join the Way of Blue, because I'm not scared of invaders, I can fend for myself, and I'm not particularly interested in any covenant at this point. There are covenants that I'm going to join for uh, certain content that I'm going to show for the playthrough, but this is not one of them. I see. Then you'll have to brave this treacherous journey on your own. If you ever require help. Come back, any time. I will stay here and pray for your safety. Do you feel lonely here? It suits me just fine, as I have nothing left anyway. It will grow on you, this place. Give it some time. Okay, his dialogue takes forever to get through, but you get a gesture out of it. Not a very cool one, but still, I mean, I wanted to show it anyway. And you can also enter the Covenant. 
Continuing to talk to him is going to give you some valuable information. He will tell you about the three different directions you can go, being uh, the Forest of Fallen Giants, the Gutter, or the big well that leads to the Gutter, or the uh, Hades Tower of Flame. And he also gave us a reminder of what our objective is. We have to find the four large souls, and uh, we have to empower ourselves with them and go back to the Emerald Herald. So, that is all part of the game plan right May now. You find peace on your journey. Alright, I'm sorry that took so long, but we are finally ready to go party. So I'm going to rest at this bonfire first to get back that little sliver of durability that I lost on my hand axe. I cannot wait until I get 20 dexterity to start cracking this thing around. Now that's one thing I probably should say is I tried recording part two last night, but my visual driver completely crapped out, crashed on me, ruined the footage completely, and this is actually a restart of that character. I had to start over. But luckily, within my first couple tries, I was able to get the old whip again with the petrified something, but I didn't get the white ring, and it was disappointing. I highly doubt I will ever be able to get that combo again. The white ring and the old whip is very, very, um, that is very, very low probability. What that was was me getting incredibly lucky, which doesn't happen very often, so just goes to show. I appreciate what you have for what it is. Right here, you get a rusted coin in this chest. We already covered what that was. It increases your item discovery. It has uses in the playthrough, I promise, but just not right now. And when you go this way, the store right here takes forever to open, and it shuts automatically behind you. So, just letting you know, if you open the door, and then you set your controller down and take a drink or something, and you look back and it's closed, your game is not broken, I promise. See? Okay. This is the entrance to the Forest of Fallen Giants, and there's a unique little trick right here that a lot of people are going to try and fail at, but I'm going to show you the right way to do it. Be careful going down these planks, because if you fall into the water, it is death. There's a human effigy in this chest down here. You definitely want that. Now you see that item over there? You can jump to it. Fairly easily. Just make sure you wait until you get to the edge to jump. We get a homer bone and a soul of a lost undead. Now this little cavern that we're in right here, it's just uh, a separate way to get to that item. Because if we had gone the normal way, we would have come down this hill. And you could just cut around there, go inside the cavern to get that item, or you can jump across like I did. Now, these enemies that we're about to face, these are just regular hollow foot soldiers. They don't hit particularly hard, they're not smart at all, and even in numbers, they're not exactly dangerous. We got an item over there, I believe it's a life gem, but before we go running for that, let's go cover the only dangerous part about the situation up here. There's an archer back there. He can shoot at you from all the way over there, which means as soon as you peek around the corner, you are in his line of sight. You also aggro these guys in turn. So now we've got these hollows coming at us. They are not a problem at all, I promise. These guys are super easy. They die in two or three hits, or even one, depending on what weapon you're using. And now what we have to do is worry about him, the guy that is playing dead right underneath him, and the guy that is standing over there waiting for the ambush. So what I'm gonna do, I'm going to hide behind this tree. And use the tree as cover when you get that item. Now I'm going to run over here. Because there's a nice little bonfire. And what do you know? Rosalyn. Sorry, Rosalyn. I'm not going to summon you, but I may as well see what you look like. Okay, we got a cleric with the Hate Knight Sword. Interesting. I'm not going to show much multiplayer, aside from PvP. I will always play online, so you guys can see me get invaded, just for raw footage. Now, I recommend you run for the archer first. Because that guy with the sword takes forever to get up to you. And while you're fighting this guy, you will have to worry about getting shot in the back by the archer. This guy right here is not dead. He's playing dead. 
smash him with a jump attack or whatever. Any means you feel like taking to get rid of him. As soon as you kill him, you are free to go loot this item safely. It's a soul item. You want as many of those as you can get in the beginning of the game because that is your currency. That's how you level up. That's how you buy things. You want that. Okay. I'm going to stop at the top of this ladder just out of their sight so you can get a quick view of what we're about to deal with. That big guy in the white armor against the tree, that is the Hade Knight. He is one of, I think, three. Yeah, one of three in each playthrough. And he is not messing around. That guy is tough. However, he's not hostile unless you attack him first, so you don't have to fight him. These guys that are walking around, they are just regular hollow infantry. There are three of them walking around on foot, and there is yet another one playing dead over by the fog gate over there. These guys are not the problem, though. The problem is that guy up there. See, right underneath the tip of my health bar, there is an archer. He is going to be a serious problem for us while we're fighting these guys. So what I recommend is get up the ladder, and you can get these guys to come down if you want, and you can fight them down there, under cover, without worrying about the archer. Or you can run over there, get behind the tree and use it for cover, and fight them like that. What I'm going to do is the more practical method. I'm going to get them to come after me like this. Now they will fall, because they're stupid. You just wait for it. Like that. They will start going up the ladder, though. So, drop down at your leisure, and we'll take care of them down here. Since I have them both in a corridor, it's easy to kill them with the hitbox of my axe. Nice try with the jump attack, but you failed. No, 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 no. I want to pick up the items. Okay, we got throwing knife. What else do we got here? And a life gem. Score. Okay. We got this one guy wandering around up here, I think. No, he actually followed us down. Never mind. Okay, since I got a bow, I could take this guy out like this. It'd be really easy. I'm not going to use the bow for him. I'm going to use it to pull this guy who's playing dead. Yeah, that guy, he jumps up out of nowhere while you're about to go through the fog gate. And he's going to be a pain in your ass. I'm not going to worry about picking up any of these items yet, because I would like to clear the enemies first. It's just a, sort of a habit for me in these games. That item over there, you are correct in your assumption. You do need to jump over. There is a special trick to making this jump, and I'm going to show you exactly how to do it in a minute. Okay, there's two guys here on the steps. They're easy, though can see, as long as you two-hand your weapon, you can get both of them caught in your hitbox, and they go down super easy. What you need to watch out for is how tight the space is. You need to make sure that you're in the center of the steps when you attack them, because if you try to attack them while you're next to a wall, you're going to bounce like that. It's going to interrupt your attack, it'll leave you wide open, and you're going to get punished for it. You use the rock for cover right here while you get this item, because the archer cannot hit you with all that debris in the way. Now you could shoot him from right here if you have a bow or throwing knives, but I find it more satisfying to run up and hit him in the face with my axe. So we're going to do that. Ah, uh, of course I would do that. That's what happens when you don't wait to get your endurance back. Alright, let's try that one more time. That was slightly embarrassing. I'm gonna go ahead and waste a life gem. Now, what you want to do is you want to use your Estus Flask first. But, I honestly have a ton of life gems right now, so it's really not a big deal. I don't exactly need to conserve them, because I'm not worried about getting invaded. And uh, there, there isn't really a big difference in speed between them. The Short Sword and the Soul of a Lost Undead. I am going to switch to the Short Sword because my Hand Axe is seriously hurting on durability right now. 
And I'm going to go ahead and equip this just for the sake of it. Okay. Let's go ahead and uh, get that item across there. Okay. So, the special way to get this item is when you jump, you want to make sure that you are against the wall when you jump. You want to make sure that you are essentially scaling that big rock wall right there. It's not that hard. But, if you jump out in this direction, you're going to miss and you're going to die because the drop is pretty far. It's further than it looks. So, this is the way you want to do it. Success. Alright. This uh, soul, the Nameless Soldier and those ten throwing knives, they are going to come in more handy than you know. So, take the jump at your own risk, but be noted that it is worth it if you do. Okay. So now it is time to loot these items real quick. Hey man, I'm just going to steal this. I hope you don't care. And then we are going to take on the Mighty Hate Knight. Alright, do yourself a favor. Be at full health when you fight this guy. Because you have no idea how hard he can hit and it's going to be a surprise to you. When you aggro him, you make him stand up with just one hit. When he stands up, you can get a free backstab. Notice how we're not doing very much damage to him. This is where the magic of the dagger comes in handy. When you find an opening to backstab this guy, which is incredibly difficult, I'm going to show you how to do it though. Using the dagger to get a backstab on him is going to be the winner's strategy. Now that attack right there where he flails, that is his backstab prevention combo. Self-explanatory. It'll make it impossible to get a backstab on him when he does that. And he does it a lot because he's expecting you to try and get a backstab. He has a lot of health and a lot of defense. Most people are going to put two and two together in their head, go for the backstab to kill him faster. Well, you know what? The Hate Knight is prepared. That's his typical three-hit combo. However, he is hard to backstab because he rarely leaves his back open, and he can chain into that backstab prevention combo at any point. He does not have to recover from his current combo to do it. He can do it almost instantly. So you need to watch out for that. So what we want to do is watch out for this. That right there is his jab attack. It happens without warning because he stands there for a minute thinking that, well, it makes you believe that there's a window to attack when in reality you're about to get stabbed really hard in the face. So what you can do is you can get near him and bait his attacks to leave him open for a backstab or you can do what I'm about to do. Dodge and punish. You see how much more damage that did versus the short sword? Well, once you get a successful backstab on him with the dagger, you can chunk away at his health with your regular weapon with no problem. Let me show you the magic of the short sword. Let him attack first. I prefer he does the jab, because it leaves him open longer. It has a thrust attack. That attack, I hate it so much. There we go. The thrust attack of the short sword is incredibly viable. You can do it with two hands, or you can do it with one hand. Either way, it's super useful. It's probably one of the better weapons in the beginning of the game, no matter how typical it sounds. It's really good. The Hade Knight Sword is a 100% chance drop from your first Hade Knight. You will always get the sword, no matter what. It starts off with decent base damage. It's got 75 uh, base damage, but it has 50 lightning damage. So you can essentially be doing lightning damage right at the start of the game. It is a really good sword. It has three C's in scaling. It's got a C in strength, dexterity, and the lightning scaling. It's a super good weapon. It does a lot of damage in the beginning of the game. It has a very versatile moveset, being horizontal versus, uh, yeah, I mean, being vertical versus horizontal when you swing it, I'll, I'll show you. 
it swings vertically instead of horizontal. And the strong attack is a horizontal sweep chained into a stab. It's a really good weapon in the beginning of the game. Highly recommend you invest the 16 strength to use, or the 11 strength to use it, which I don't have. But we're going to be getting that much anyway, so it doesn't matter. I'm going to stick with the short sword for now, though. Okay. I'm going to jam it up real quick because I want full health for this part. This is another ambush. When you look in this room, there are two guys in here. You can't really get their attention by standing here because they're just going to stare back at you. See if I... Yeah, I can get the other guy in there too. They're both standing here. And if you drop down into this room, you need to be either confident or really, really steady in defense. Because if you have defense, you can tank their hits and just steamroll them. But if you're brave, you can use the room to your advantage and uh, roll past the debris, like the barrels and stuff. They will get caught on those. And you can use that to your advantage to hit them while they're trying to get around the barrels. If you go this way, there's going to be a guy standing here with an axe. And he always does the same exact thing. He does the jump attack as soon as he sees you. You cannot lock on from round corners. You have to get right on top of him. What you can do is you can attack him straight away. Or you can just dodge the initial hit. What I like to do... Oh, come on. Oops. Okay, I had no choice but to just dodge there. You see, this is why I like using the short sword for this part. We're in another hallway, so if we try to just blatantly swing... Oops. We're just gonna bounce like that. It's gonna leave us open to be attacked. What you don't want to do for this part is get that guy's attention first. Just stand in front of the doorway and get these guys. Oh, come on. There we go. That was that was the plan right there. Wanted to wanted to get both of them with the uh, jab attack. Okay, we go in here. There are some bolts right here. Not that we need them because we don't have a crossbow. We have a bow. Okay, this guy down here is not messing around. All you have to do is get up to uh, right where you see the entrance where the two pillars are coming out of the wall. It's like four steps in front of us. As soon as you get to that, you will pull him. This guy is a total badass. He has thick armor. He has a bastard sword, which hits incredibly hard. It can kill us in like three to four hits, even with our awesome bandit armor. And he has a combo that is, consists of violent sweeps and even a, I believe he has a thrust animation too. What I'm going to do to make the most out of the situation is I'm going to get as rid of as much health as I can by hitting him in the head. But first, before I even do that, I don't want this guy to get near me. I want to kill him before he even has a chance to swing. So we're going to use those throwing knives that we banked on earlier. So I'm going to shoot him in the head. There we go. Now you notice how he also runs really fast. So that guy, no, you definitely don't want to mess with him. Right here, this is an interesting little trap. You got a guy with a bow up there at the very top of the steps. He's going to start shooting at us as soon as we get in his line of sight. And you see those pair of legs up there sitting on the thing? Yeah, that's another badass with a bastard sword. However, this guy doesn't come running at you like a maniac and try to chop your head off. His primary, uh, his primary, of, well... <laughs> It's not even, it's not even primary, it's just really dick what he does. This guy throws firebombs at you versus, you know, trying to engage in melee. What I should do is plug this guy in the face, but because I want to save my arrows, I'm going to use this little corridor to my advantage. I'm going to wait for him to shoot. And then he moves like that. It's a very interesting little mechanic. I don't know why it is counterproductive for him, but that means we can run up there and kill him before that guy has a chance to throw firebombs at us. I would honestly prefer he throw firebombs versus trying to hit me with his claymore. Because, not claymore, his bastard sword. Because that thing hurts. 
he has really bad aim. I should probably note that. Yeah, he sucks. You hit him with a throwing knife. Does half his health. Ah, uh, and then that happens. Yeah, even even when he's not on his little spot anymore, he tries to throw firebombs at you constantly. All right, so we got rid of him. Now there's a guy sitting over here in the corner. I don't know why. I guess he's trying to be sneaky. Get rid of him. And we got a buckler. This is going to be our first decent shield in the game. It's not by any means good, but it does have a very particular use. The buckler is uh, a light shield. It only blocks 75% physical damage. Its elemental resistances are below average. It only has 30 stability, but it weighs a unit and a half. It weighs 1.5, which is good. It's very lightweight. Its primary use is this. It has a very unique parry animation that has a longer window than typical shields. So you can pull off parries a little bit easier with this thing. We're going to keep it just because, I mean, it's a shield. It's going to reduce 75% of the damage that I should be taking to the face. So, that's good for us. we got a guy chilling over here with a halberd. When you run out in front of this uh, post here, as soon as... He can't really see you because his head is tilted down, but figuratively, where he can see you like this, he will stand up and engage. Now, the halberd guys, they give people a lot of trouble in their first playthrough. But I'm going to give you some magic pointers that will help you steamroll these guys. Pointer number one. Count to three. The Halberd guys swing in three hit intervals. And three. And that's all they do. However, you see they recover pretty quickly, and they can chain into a new combo pretty fast. That one hit did that much damage to me. Now, multiply that by three. It would have almost killed us if he had landed three successful hits. So that's why you need to be careful of the halberd guys. Just remember, count to three. Wait until he swings three times, and then punish. Retaliate with whatever you see fit for killing him. The item we just got is the Witching Urn. Explodes to deal magic damage. It is just like a firebomb. However, you swap out fire damage for magic damage. It's a pretty useful item. You can buy plenty of them, as many as you want, as a matter of fact. It's very versatile for PvP, even more versatile for PvE. You definitely want to grab those, because they will have a pretty good amount of uses. So this is our next bonfire, and we have found ourselves another merchant as well. So I'm going to rest at this bonfire so we can get our durability back, and uh, not go all the way back after we die, right? So, that concludes episode 2 of the Expert Walking for Dark Souls 2. I've been your favorite host, Let's Play Dark Souls HD. Thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, I will catch you all next time. Later. <laughs>